what Brendan has asked us to do is to talk about next steps. So I'd like to invite the next panel up. So um, if you might come up, that's right. Yeah, just just please do. Yes, sit sit wherever you'd, you'd like to sit. That would be great. Um, we don't really have time for much of an introduction, but what I'm going to do is just ask everybody to say uh, just one or two words about themselves uh, to introduce themselves before they begin talking about the next steps that, that they feel might be appropriate. Uh, Nikush Carlo, uh, many of you may know, Athabaskan, PhD, formerly with NSF, formerly with the State Department, uh, used to be the advisor for the governor of Alaska on Arctic policy and on climate. Julian Stroh from the University of Manitoba and the National Snow and Ice Center. And Terry Chapin, a UAF uh, professor emeritus, uh, a, a wonderful ecologist who's worked on sustainability for years. Before we get into next steps, I'm just going to give you a one minute summary of the last two and a half days. <laughs> the Arctic of today is nothing like the Arctic of yesterday and nothing at all like the Arctic of tomorrow. The change that is happening is stunningly rapid and it is increasing in speed. The impacts that those changes are having on the people of the Arctic are profound. We have heard moving stories about the risks to food security, to personal security, to their communities. The risks as a result of those Arctic changes to people beyond the Arctic globally are already being felt and are likely also to accelerate and intensify. The science community knows a lot, but is having some difficulty in communicating what they know in a way that is changing policy. The indigenous knowledge holders in the world who are contributing, want to and need to contribute more, and the science and indigenous, did indigenous knowledge holders need to find new ways, want to find new ways to work together to more effectively communicate, but also more effectively understand the changes underway and what needs to be done about it. Policymakers are being called to listen and to learn and to take action. Now what we're going to do is try to talk a little bit more about the how of those shoulds and will and, and hopefully must. And then we will turn to you at the end and give you the solemn responsibility of taking everything that you have learned and heard and thought about and perhaps some of the ideas that you will hear from our panel about next steps. So I'd like to start with Nikush, who has thought a lot over the years about how to make this happen and because she has worked in a variety of capacities, uh, I suspect she has some answers for us. Thank you, Brad. Right. Can you hear me? Am I, are we good? Okay. I've learned over the years that I absolutely voice. have to have Outside voice. <laughs> a microphone. Um, thank you for uh, the introduction. Um, it, you started in the right place. I'm Athabascan Indian from the interior of Alaska. And that is really, you know, at my core, that is, that is what grounds me. I'm also a scientist, um, a neuroscientist, and I've worked at multiple levels. Um, in the policy world, um, from the statewide level to the federal level to the international level. Um, so as I think back over the last three days and our time together, it's, you know, we're at a critical point as humans, as a society, and we've heard this, we are one people, right? And we're facing you know, rapid change, and we together need to figure out how we're going to survive. And as indigenous peoples, we're at this point where we need to maintain our traditions and our value systems that are deeply tied to the land where we've come from. So we've, we've heard that in, in, from many different people, um, many different speakers. 
Um, and we know the world is going to change. It's changing right now. And the impacts are greater for some of us than for others of us. And we need to recognize that inequality um, and consider how to honestly address that. Um, failure to act, we've also heard a lot about this, failure to act, failure to adequately prepare is going to be very costly. Um, we're going to see increased public health costs, increased infrastructure repair costs, um, lower productivity, um, you know, detriment to our health and, and well-being, loss of income from key resources like fisheries. Um, I think I've seen some numbers, $5 billion for infrastructure alone without adaptation measures. And that doesn't even, not even the tip of the iceberg for you know, the things that we're going to lose from losing our connection, uh, our cultural and spiritual bond to our land. So how we respond, um, how we respond to this is really going to influence what the Arctic looks like today, what it looks like you know, tomorrow, what it looks like in 2050, and what it looks like in the next 10,000 years. So I want to take a moment and recognize um, my gratitude to all the indigenous peoples who have gathered here today and for your commitment to being here. This space is and can be difficult for us to be in. And I want to acknowledge that. And I know that many of you, you know, made a commitment to be here. You're missing time with your families. You're missing a critical time to gather resources, um, a traditional food harvests in this fall season. Um, so on a I also want to recognize the positive um, intent that this gathering was organized. I want to thank the organizing committee uh, for your support um, for, to the indigenous participants working group for your efforts and contributions. We wouldn't have had the engagement that we have seen in this space without your efforts. Um, and it was a step forward in strengthening in indigenous engagement. I, I, I do believe that. We have more to do. And you guys knew that was coming, right? <laughs> we have more to do. Um, we, from my perspective, we haven't yet reached a comfort level where we can have really fluid communication um, and really have a deep understanding of what diverse per perspectives are in the Arctic. So many panelists um, and participants uh, have mentioned how critical it is to build relationships, relationships between scientists, indigenous people, indigenous knowledge holders, um, and scientists, and with policymakers. Like these relationships are really important. And many of you mentioned that in order to build relationships, it takes some really honest discussion, listening, learning, respect, and time to build trust before you can move to the steps of identifying common goals and together identifying what the various options are and ways to go forward. So we've taken a step in this process, and we should feel OK about that. Um, I think we also need to recognize that um, there are other things we need to do, and we need to do them uh, perhaps in a different way. We need stronger exchanges, open, more open dialogue, really truthful discussion that will be hard about what the challenges are that are hindering the communication between, between us. Uh, we need to make this personal. And by necessity, that means smaller than this really large tent. <laughs> so there's multiple steps that need to you know, go through this process, so that means Maybe some meetings like this, some more additional meetings like this, but it also means meeting in different ways. And I'm going to come back to this point in a second, meeting in different ways. This is not easy. It requires commitment from everyone. I'm glad you are all here, because that shows commitment. Um, relationships take a lot of work to maintain. And I know you know that. 
So as we think about ways forward, I want to challenge you to think about, I'm going to talk about three different things. Um, think about how we address imbalance. And here in this space, you know, it's, it's hard to be an indigenous person in this space. It's not uh, comfortable. We're in a Western science building, and we're in DC with lots of policymakers. So you can see how it's not, you know, it's not a space that it's easy for us to, us to be in. Uh, so I'd suggest a different type of meeting one that is led and convened by indigenous people. In a place where we have a connection to the land. And I think that would be an entirely different meeting and a different discussion. And who knows where that would lead us but I think if we have an open and honest relationship, we can start down that path to see. The other thing I want to challenge you to think about is resources. And this was mentioned in the, in the last panel and at various points throughout the um, last few days. They come in, you know, resources come in many forms. Um, we should think about how to provide resources in equitable ways ways that empower indigenous people or underrepresented peoples, as we think about this broadly, um, to think about where we can create new funding sources. And I have some ideas about that. Um, we can think about, I think venture capital was mentioned in, in the last panel, social impact investing. There's a number of mechanisms related to carbon offset programs, uh, green banks that fuel energy efficiency and renewable energy retrofits. Like these are all funding mechanisms that can be uh, funneled in a way that supports community adaptation. I think we should think about that. And then the last thing, um, we've talked a lot about institutions and how many existing institutions there are. And I think we should, I challenge you to consider more, because we've talked about it some, how these institutions are meeting our needs and whether we can effectively communicate within those structures. And we've heard, we had a good example this morning, we heard about their need, that there needs to be commitment and leadership at a really high level of these governance structures. I also think there needs to, should be an opportunity for indigenous people to lead in those conversations. And I think about this in terms of climate change because that's the area that I work in most closely. And when we think about effective and timely response to climate change, there needs to be a way to address issues that require this coordination. We've turned, heard a lot about how many different agencies are involved or not involved or should be involved, but how do we coordinate? How do we together have uh, pulled together the resources that are necessary to have a very timely response? And I love the example we talked about this morning from Canada. So I think we should think about that process a little more. How do we empower existing coordinating bodies? How do, you know, that might mean revising mandates, but really making institutions work for us. Um, so those are the three things I ask you to think more about. Ways to correct imbalance, ways to provide adequate um, resourcing, and evolving institutions to be more responsive. And I'm sure we're going to come back to these when we hear from the other panelists. But before I turn the, the, the mic over to Fran, um, I do want to address something. Um, I want to briefly address the gathering of indigenous participants over lunch yesterday and, and today. And I, I wanted to say that our protocols and, and the way that we gather in places is different. We, you know, we want to introduce ourselves. It takes a while. It was really hard for me to do the real short introdu introduction. Um, 
And we all come from different places, and we don't often have an opportunity to meet face to face. But this is an opportunity to do that, an opportunity to connect, an opportunity to build collaborations. Uh, and I talked about the imbalance of, of being in this space and how difficult that can be. And I recognize that, you know, as an indigenous person, to float between different spaces and, and, and different wor worlds, but when we're here, we need to support each other. And we need to have an opportunity to share ideas, um, to introduce ourselves, to understand where, what land we're coming from, the places we come from, our families, our histories, as well as to understand what each of us are bringing, what our current issues are, and that we're bringing to this meeting. So I understand that there was some comments and questions about that gathering, but so I just wanted to provide some information in the spirit of speaking to our truths and opening an honest dialogue. So with that. Great. Thank you. Terry, I want to turn to you because I know you've done a lot of work in Alaska and elsewhere helping communities think about sustainability and bringing your expertise along with their expertise to make progress. Can you talk a little bit about next steps that you see based on both your experience and what you've heard today? Sure. Well, I, I've been really inspired by this conference and especially by the presentation this morning about uh, setting up the marine protected area in northern Canada. And I can imagine a future in which indigenous residents are recognized as stewards of the land and sea where they live and where they play us, where they play us, uh, where they can draw on both traditional knowledge and Western science to play a really strong role in shaping the future of those areas. I can, I can also imagine a way in which they could play unique roles in helping convey the importance of the Arctic to the people in the rest of Alaska, the rest of the United States, the rest of the world, in a way that the scientific community has been somewhat less successful. So I'd like to just talk about some ways in which that might uh, be brought forward. One of the messages that's been most clear to me, I think, from this meeting is that as we look to the future, Western scientists and, and indigenous residents have a great deal in common. Both of these groups have important tools for observing change. And all of us are passionate about, uh, have a passionate concern for the future of the Arctic, although it's much more immediate and personal for Arctic residents because their lives and livelihoods and culture are on the line here. But all of us want a future in which our grandchildren can flourish and want to be part of a future where nature is not radically different than what we have today. So this is a challenge. So I'd suggest that, that we can influence the future of the Arctic more effectively if we work together than if we, these two groups take separate paths. But if this is going to happen effectively, I think there are at least three things that need to be changed uh, in order to, to move forward in this way. There needs to be more effective communication between indigenous residents and Western scientists that choose to work together. And as Nikush was saying, this is going to require dialogue and mutual, re mutual respect and building of trust. It's clear to me from this conference that, that there's many cases where this has happened very effectively, but also many cases where it's not, ha not happened so well. And I can imagine several steps that might facilitate this. First, developing effective knowledge sharing hubs that would enable scientists and indigenous experts to find one another to explore shared interests. In addition, engaging indigenous experts in advising and participating in the design and conduct of research that's intended to improve scientific understanding and to benefit communities at the same time. And finally, proper community engagement, uh, training and acceptance by scientists of best practices for scientific collaboration with communities. 
And there's already well-developed guidelines that have been developed by the Alaska Native Science Commission, the National Science Foundation, Alaska Native Knowledge Network, and many tribes in, in particular parts of Alaska. And it seems to me that this type of training should be expected of every Arctic science, just as the way now Arctic scientists are scientists are expected to know statistics or other tools. It's something that needs to be part of the toolkit of everybody who works in the Arctic. And when I looked at the posters and listened to the talks here, I saw really excellent examples of all three of these things. So I know that we know how to do this. It just needs to be applied more extensively, and we need to learn from some of these efforts that have been successful. The second change I'd like to see would be greater opportunities for indigenous residents and uh, Western scientists to collaborate to co-produce knowledge. But this probably isn't always appropriate. So it seems best to start with issues and people where, there, where this is going to be mutually beneficial for both communities and for science. And this goes back to that knowledge hub and trying to Co trying to pull together the right people to do things in the right places. I, as part of this, I think it's also really important to increase the opportunities for indigenous youth to be part of this process, to learn, to bring indigenous science to these discussions, and to have a chance to participate in Western science at the same time. And a third change that I think we need is to convey more compellingly to the people of Alaska and the United States and the world that Arctic change is happening right now and that this has important consequences for themselves and their grandchildren. Scientists can explain the biophysical connections and the types of risks that may be going to occur in other places, but the risks that are being experienced in Alaska today are the same magnitude of risks, the same deep problems that people are going to face in most parts of the world by 2050 or before. So it's the kinds of things where the experience in Alaska can be really meaningful to people elsewhere. And scientists have a lot to learn from ind indigenous residents about the power of stories. Most scientists like me have been trained not to tell stories. It's been beaten out of us because these are called anecdotes and you don't do that as part of scientific communication with other scientists. But it is so important in terms of communicating with a broader public. And I think we need to think more about how to connect the heart with the mind, to speak from the heart in talking to people about things that are happening. That's the sort of thing that I think will be more compelling. But it needs to... And I think this is a place where indigenous residents can, can speak very effectively, both for their, from their own experiences and in helping scientists like me learn how to value and use these sorts of skills. Finally, I don't think there's any recipe for this type of collaboration. It's going to be different from place to place and person to person. Some communities and scientists uh, will probably not be interested in this, uh, and we'll continue to make mistakes, and we'll need to, but we need to open the doors for opportunities to make this work. And then uh, these kinds of collaborations are likely to be more common. And as they become more common, we'll build up more experience about how to do it well. And I think this can drive the process of greater collaboration uh, among indigenous and Western scientists and also the opportunity to convey more compellingly to the rest of the world about the nature of rapid change in the Arctic. Great. Julianne? Yeah, so for those that don't know me, I've been spending, I guess, the last 20 years or so focused on monitoring Arctic sea ice. And, and most of this is using satellite data. And I would say, you know, when I started out in my career in the early 1990s, I didn't think that we had to worry about climate change or global warming. It seemed like we had enough ice. Um, but then in the 2000s, when we kept having one record low sea ice summer after another, that we couldn't neatly explain with our understanding of weather and sea ice, we realized something different was happening. 
And with the discovery that the pace of the ice loss that we were seeing in our observations was actually happening faster than the, our most sophisticated climate models could forecast that Marika was talking about the other day, it made me realize that in my lifetime, I will probably see an Arctic Ocean that will be ice-free in summer. And this was something I'd never thought about you know, during my education, and I thought we were way far off from this. What's become even a little bit more alarming to me is the realization with the new climate models that are going into the next IPCC report to be released in 2022, is that some of these models now are also losing their winter ice by the end of this century. This is a really scary trajectory and something I hope is not correct. I hope the models are wrong about this, but it might be something that we have to consider in the future. And just thinking about policies, I'm going to start with policy first and then talk a bit more about um, community co-production of knowledge that we've been talking a lot about. But the last panel was, was a policy panel, and it got me thinking a little bit about how you know, we have a lot of uncertainty in our forecast of what's going to happen in the future. And even if we had perfect models, we would still have some uncertainty just because there's a lot of natural climate variability in our system. And so we can't exactly tell you, well, what date is the Arctic Ocean going to be ice-free? But that isn't the question we probably even should be asking. Because sea ice doesn't care about time. Greenland doesn't care about time. Permafrost doesn't care about time. It cares about how much more CO2 we keep adding to the atmosphere. And so we can start looking at more concrete things like, well, how much more CO2 can we put in the atmosphere before the Arctic Ocean might go ice-free? This is a metric that policymakers perhaps could use better in decision making, for example. And the problem is, though, as scientists, we're not really trained to do this. We don't get formal training on how to communicate with policymakers or other decision makers. And I think this is something we need to focus on more, I think, early on in our careers, as we're starting out as students or even early on in our science careers. You know, perhaps looking at more sort of policy science fellowships where scientists could go work with a policymaker for six months, learn about what policymakers need from scientists in order to make decisions, and also to help ensure that policies that is being made integrates amongst the science and engineering and planning communities. And I think that would be a key way forward to help us foster a better dialogue, at least with the people that are making decisions. You know, at the same time, we've heard a lot about the need to work with Arctic communities to co-develop strategies and policy pathways for locally and regionally critical livelihoods that reflect and enhance adaptation to the changing Arctic. But this is not easy for most scientists. We are often not rewarded for community engagement, and this is something Hayo brought up, but it's very true. We're so busy, we're so focused on publishing or securing more funding because that is how we're judged. Our H index really matters if we're trying to find a job. So we need to come up with a new paradigm and a new framework that will allow for this engagement with communities, um, the general public, and policymakers. And it shouldn't just be something we tick off in our proposals. You know, and, I, and I'm guilty of that myself. And you know, we've heard yesterday that you know, scientists says we just need to open up the ways of knowing. I mean, we're so focused on our scientific method, but there's many ways of knowing that we've heard about throughout this meeting. And we have the greatest impact when we all work together. And so new pathways for interaction are needed. At the same time, we have heard today about the fatigue in some communities where you have so many different scientists from different agencies coming in. And so some sort of coordinated effort is needed. And this hub that you were talking about, I think, could be a great way to sort of coordinate these efforts so that there isn't this community fatigue when scientists are trying to come in. And then there's just basic science needs, either from aspects of funding mechanisms and as well as science innovation. It has become increasingly clear from the past few days that we need a funding framework that encourages participatory approaches that foster engagement with local communities, incorporates their regional knowledge of changes, helps foster working across borders, including international funding mechanisms that are not just across Arctic nations, but also non-Arctic nations, we really need to have free sharing of data, sharing of research infrastructure, sharing of observation systems, and of knowledge. And I think, you know, it, I can see that this is starting to happen. There are evidences of this happening, but there's still barriers that exist. And the competitive nature of science also kind of hinders this to some extent. You know, we want to get that first paper out of the data that we collect, for example. But we're not going to be able to, you know, work together if, unless we start being more open and sharing. I think something I also sort of caught on to a little bit 
at this meeting is that communities still lack trust in scientists that come into their communities. So that may also hinder some of this data sharing. Um, at the same time, I think as scientists, we don't always know how to best translate local knowledge into our science. And so we need more tools and education on, on how best to do that. So we need more cooperation and programs that will facilitate knowledge transfer across nations, communities, and scientists and decision makers. And there are efforts underway. We heard about Mosaic, which is going to be involving 16 nations and 60 institutions. And there has to be free sharing of data from everybody that's collecting data on the ship. But as we heard, there's no indigenous representation in Mosaic. There's other efforts that we heard about. So NSF's navigating the new Arctic, EU PolarNet. Um, there's a new Canada, um, UK initiative for new science that has to involve local communities. So there are these efforts underway that can help towards this, but obviously more is needed. And also with community monitoring programs. There are certain nations that are providing more opportunities to do this, but it's not universal at this point. So I also want to mention, I mean, it's not just that we need to have programs in place that help foster sort of this um, international sort of collaboration with, with funding programs, but we should also have more exchanges with students, not just going between countries, but also being able to come and work, for example, in policy at maker's offices or working within local communities to get the training early on in their career so that they can be successful. I don't know what to do about one of the issues that we heard about on, um, I think it was yesterday, about just how the funding doesn't necessarily keep up with the pace of change that's happening in the Arctic. But there's got to be a way that we can start treating the Arctic as an emergency and so that we can quickly mobilize funding to deal with the important um, science and community challenges that are being faced right now in Arctic communities. From a research perspective, there has been a lot of progress, I think, towards improving our models and especially individual components of models, whether it's the sea ice or it's the ocean or the atmosphere. Um, and there's been a lot of um, increase also in observational capacity. But again, today we heard how we're still quite data poor in many regions. And so we do need more investment in innovative and low-cost observational platforms, as well as sustaining current long-term observational um, networks. And this is also true for community monitoring. There's a wealth of data out there that we really haven't tapped into yet. And I think we need to focus our efforts as well on these community monitoring programs. We're going to have to figure out better ways of cost sharing, though, because you know satellite platforms are super expensive. And you can't expect one nation to deal with all the satellite um, programs, but we need this data so desperately to get the big picture of changes and to ensure that we have you know, this long-term continuity of a climate data record. We have 40 years of satellite data right now, and some of these data records are at risk of being lost or not continued, and so we really need to focus our efforts there. Um, and we, we need to get creative, I think, with our <laughs> technologies, even when we're not working with satellites but working in the field. We deployed um, seven buoys last summer. Um, on about 1.2 meters thick ice. We thought they would survive, but they melted out within about 10 days. And so this summer, we, we, we changed our buoy system so that they'd all be floatable so that we, we wouldn't lose them. Then we put them in 1.8 meter thick ice, but then a bear came and smashed all four of them. <laughs> so, you know, we have to get more creative on how we make our observations that we need to understand the climate system in the Arctic. And we also really have to desperately increase our predictive skill on the short term, so daily to weekly, to seasonal, to decadal, and to long-term um, forecasts. And each one of these has different challenges and different science requirements from observations that will feed the short-term and medium-range forecasts to improved process understanding that feed our global climate models. A lot of our parameterizations in these models are based on observations that we made when the Arctic Ocean, for example, was covered by thick multi-year ice. And they don't necessarily hold in this world we find ourselves today with thin first-year ice. So, and also, you know, sea ice forecasting and weather forecasting in the Arctic really does lag weather forecasting for the globe as a whole by several decades. So we're in a rush to catch up. So there's a lot of work we still need to do. And I think, too, about climate models. I mean, we've talked, Fran was mentioning regional downscaling, which we need to do from our climate models so we can address local impacts. But also, we need to think of innovative ways that we could maybe bring in land management practices into these models herding and hunting practices, um, ecological, social, like paleoecological changes, things like that into these climate models so we can make better forecasts. 
One thing I think is really clear from listening to everybody over the last two and a half days is, and especially the indigenous peoples, is we don't need to tell Arctic communities that they're in a climate emergency. They're living it every single day. And sustainability cannot be a project here and there. It has to be holistic, it has to be long-term, and it has to be strategic. Science has an important role to play in this, but we need to start thinking outside of the box to advance our adaptive capacity of Arctic and non-Arctic communities to climate and biodiversity changes. And I think this hasn't always been so easy for scientists. As was mentioned yesterday, we tend to be stuck in these formalized structures, and so we haven't always been open to other ways of knowing. I think this conference is a great way to showing that we're open to changing that, but it's, it's a slow process, and I, I think we can get there. But we need to find synergies between local and indigenous communities, ambitions for adaptation actions with novel forms of land management, geared towards climate mitigation and sustainable development. Science should happen alongside Arctic residents and stakeholders so that together we can identify the risks and viable strategies for adaptation in relationship to the projected changes that we have from our climate models so that we can plan for future resilience in the Arctic social and ecosystems. So I just wanted to end by saying, you know, the challenge of climate change can be daunting. Um, but I think it's encouraging that I think we're starting to wake up, both as individuals, as communities, as nations, and as a planet. It's a slow process, but it is starting to happen. And as scientists, I think we need to shift our mindset and anchor our work in the spirit of cooperation and justice so that solutions will work in the real world for everyone. Thanks. So the problem is there aren't many policy people in this room. And to the extent that much of what needs to be done is in their space, I worry that we have not spent enough time focusing on what that challenge is. And I'm going to take just one minute to tell you two stories. When I first became a legislator, I thought legislation was based on thoughtful analysis. <laughs> And I was told by somebody who'd been around a lot longer, um, actually, legislation doesn't come by analysis. It's legislation by anecdote. Just another way of saying that telling stories, offering examples, connecting to people, connecting to constituents, connecting to voters, is kind of where the action's at. So not to rain on anybody's parade, but no amount of science alone, no amount of data, no amount of reports written or journal articles, or for that matter, heart is alone enough. You've got to connect with the political process that exists. And in every country, that's a little bit different, but Getting through to policymakers and getting through to politicians means telling stories. It means connecting to their constituents and getting the political. We also haven't talked much about politics, and that's appropriate because that's not what we're here to do. But it is kind of the elephant in the room. And I just want to say, as somebody who was in elected office for 18 years. I think pretty much everybody in this room, regardless of where they live, what language they speak, how they affiliate in terms of what they call themselves, is pretty much on the same page here, that we're long overdue for action in what is admittedly a crisis on many levels for many people, for many communities, and for many yet to come. And so I would just encourage you in this policy space to think about what your role is. And that's the second story I want to tell you. When I mentioned earlier when I introduced myself that I had had the benefit of being mentored, being educated by Alaska Natives who took the time to handhold me through learning more about their culture. I mean, when George Amawick was mayor of the North Slope Borough, he took me out to his whaling camp. So I actually saw that from 
that perspective on the ice. I remember when Will Mayo explained to me about the caribou. I remember when Ralph Sanderson, um, Anderson took me out. You know, I, I remember these things. I remember when I was adopted as a Clinket, how Rosita Whirl explained to me very personally what my obligations were as a clan member. Same thing from the science community. When I first was elected, I had Oli Matisson, a fisheries biologist with UAF, come and talk to me about how the relationship between fisheries management was essential if we wanted a strong fishing industry in Alaska, and how the science had to be supported financially in the budget, because the science was the key to wise management, which was the key to sustainability, and he adopted me, a scientist who never had met me before, adopted me and took the time to explain why science mattered to policy and to politics and to budgets. My point here is in the policy space, and frankly also in the science and indigenous knowledge space, you are a powerful actor in bridging the gap between different ways that people approach problems, solving those problems, understanding what their role is. The personal touch matters. You've talked about relationships. You could go adopt a mayor. <laughs> you could go adopt a legislator, a member of Congress. You could, if you are an indigenous knowledge holder, adopt a scientist. Because scientists may want to do the right thing, but if you don't help them, they can't do the right thing. So my short message here about the policy piece of this panel in terms of steps forward, yeah, there are structural things that would help, like internships and exchange programs. But fundamentally, each of us has the power to do that kind of personal touch that will change things. And I know it seems small, but when you've got a problem as big as climate change is, and as big as the emergency that many of our communities face, um, we each have a responsibility. So we have a few questions and comments that have come in. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of them. I, I just want to acknowledge that a number of them are indicating that we need creative ways to expand traditional knowledge to successfully inform models. I think this is a very important point. We need to have a recipe for engaging the science, the indigenous knowledge, and the decision makers in some strategically powerful way. We need Eastern sciences, scientists as well as Western scientists <laughs> from Japan and from Korea and from other countries could not agree more. We need agency heads who are currently dismantling things that rules that mitigate climate change to hear from all of us. We need a shout out to the Indigenous Climate Summit that was put on by and hosted by the Gwich'in in Fort Yukon last summer. And we have heard from scientists saying, we look forward to seeing invitations from the indigenous communities to a meeting in their space to continue this conversation. So that's just a sampling of some of the things that, that have come in. We have seven minutes left, and so what I would like to do is give to each of you about two minutes to say whatever it was that either someone else on this panel triggered or something that you forgot to say and really wanted to say before we run out of time. Nikush. Okay. Um, I'm going to build on something that you just mentioned about being personal and making that personal connection. Um, when you think about a vision for the Arctic future, I think about resilient communities. Communities, where we're all, everyone in this room is part of a community. Resilient communities that are part of a healthy ecosystem. That's what I see is the vision. And in order to get there, we need contributions from everyone. Every single person in this room, every single person outside of this room has a role to play. And I would say for the Arctic specifically, I see the Arctic as brimming with human potential. One of a kind knowledge, um, 
people that are intimately knowledgeable about the land, about the impacts. Um, and there's a responsibility for all of us to take even those small actions, to grow those into larger actions, to inspire you know, others to also take action. So I'm hopeful, so I wanna, I'm gonna leave on that note. I'm hopeful that we are going to work together and move forward toward this vision of resilient communities in a healthy ecosystem. Gary, anything else? One of the things that uh, surprised me to learn is that national elections for president, for example, are decided by, over, on average, by about 5% of the popular vote. So if people really go out and vote for what they care about, vote for, for things that, that are important to them, there's no reason why we can't change the politics around in a single election cycle. So as a scientist, I would be really welcoming of an indigenous-led workshop that indigenous people can come to explain to the scientists what matters to them, what would they like us to be studying to help them? Because I think we usually come into their arena with our ideas of what we want to study, and it's going to maybe benefit them or the globe. But it's not necessarily designed with their needs in mind. And I think part of that is, you know, we don't know enough. And I think, you know, this workshop has been a great place to start opening up this dialogue, and we need more of these kinds of efforts so that we can better understand and hear from local communities what they need from us. And in my closing, I'm going to do just two brief things. One, the U.S. Arctic Research Commission would like your input. <laughs> we really would like your input. We do this every two years in terms of identifying goals. And, you know, we've been to Nome, and we've been to Barrow, and we've been to Kotzebue, and we've been to Anchorage, and we've been to Fairbanks, and we've been also on the East Coast and in Europe. But I have to ask you, because you have to help us as we identify these goals and shine a spotlight on things that, for the future, may be the way in which funding gets put to play. And the last thing I want to do is acknowledge someone that I have known for decades who has done many different jobs and every single one of them, he has reached out to be inclusive and engage people at levels where it has been meaningful. And that person is the person who is responsible for this conference, who has thought about this conference for a year, has planned it, has put together people to help him in the steering committee. He's raised money for it. And I want you all to join me in expressing our appreciation to Brendan Kelly.